everyone. Very nice to see you all here. This is the first of our New Zealand Centre for Sustainable City Talks for 2021, um, organised by Libby Grant here. And it's our great pleasure to um, welcome a friend and colleague, um, um, Lynn Cook. And Lynn, I've just been sitting talking to Lynn, he says he's just a simple boy from Dunedin. That's where he started. But actually, he began a career in official statistics in 1971, and he was govern government statistician until 2000, and then he became Sir Humphrey in the UK, <laughs> and was the national um, statistician of the UK from 2000 to 2005. He's also been involved in official statistics in the Pacific, and was chair of the Superroom board until 2018. Uh, he also told me um, that he was part of He's a very got forward political, um, helps political parties of all kinds. He was on Muldoon's task force on tax reform. He's been on the Royal Commission on Social Policy, um, which shows his um, strong interest in equity, children and the vulnerable. Uh, he most, his most recent work has been on interpreting the institutional counts published by the justice sector and child welfare agencies put a spotlight on the significant current trends. And I must say that his contribution, um, and I think you'll find this talk absolutely fascinating, I did find one extra fact about him when he was the Registrar General um, in the UK. Um, one of his most public acts was to rule on the uh, legitimacy of the marriage of Charles, Prince of Wales, and Camilla Parker Bowles. So he's a man of many talents. Tēnā <laughs> 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 uh, koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, e rangatura mā, e kora mā, kui mā, uh, e wāne mai, koutou, ka hui mai mō tini wā. Uh, e, uh, Philippa, uh, uh, aroa kia koe. Uh, no reina, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Well, that was an introduction that I'm sure my mother would probably not even recognise me for. Uh, it, uh, I have to admit, the, the one pleasure, by the way, about being involved in the wedding of Charles and Camilla, I got the best newspaper heading I've ever had, which was, of course, on page two of the Otago Daily Times when it said, Dunedin man allows prince to wed. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so I have a great respect for the media. Uh, <laughs> What I'm going to do is talk at, um, first a little bit about why on earth we need to look a bit more deeply about statistics and the justice sector than we, than we, we tend to do. Um, and then I'm going to talk very much more substantially about, about the um, trends that exist. And when I, I my setting of really, I say a statistician's eye, I make that point because I have never worked in the justice sector. I don't happen to have any experience in the professions and involvement in the justice sector. What I do understand is that justice and child protection is one of the most difficult, challenging work areas to be in. As you've heard in the media in the last week, just about everyone in the country is an expert on it. Every event generates a new need for a piece of legislation. And it seems to be quite a remarkable place to be. Um, just a, a little bit, just to look at a little bit about uh, what, what is a statistician's eye have on it. Well, the first is we actually need to have a counterweight to the tendency for politics and legislation in the justice sector to be what I would call politely, haphazardly informed by spot markets of slogans, anecdote and sentinel events. Um, secondly, I think it's really important to find ways of bridging the gap between research and operational experience. It seems to me since we invented a policy operation split in the public sector and also created this wonderful squad of policy analysts that can move from place to place at a great speed, it's come at the expense, and certainly in the New Zealand public sector, at the complete demise of the very rich research agencies, that, bodies that used to exist in most of our major agencies. And I look, I can see David Preston there. I would say MSD until the late 80s had a world-leading research capability. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't now, but it, it's not as obvious. Um, <laughs> I want to say, we also need to counter the, the narrowness of ministerially determined performance measures. When I worked for the Blair government, and then I watched it happen in the Clark government, ministers like to define expectations for us of what's going on with their performance measures. But in doing that, they often take out of this, our sight the measures that are more important to understand their legitimacy. 
And I, and I think that narrowing, I mean, I notice that ministers are liking the, um, the deliverology agenda of the, their government. Well, the problem with that is it actually told everyone that wasn't on the agenda that their work didn't matter. But secondly, it narrowed quite significantly objectives to simple fiscal things. I think we need to have transparent responses to volatile demand pressures. I think both in child welfare with the way notifications can fluctuate quite hugely, or if you look at the prison service with the remand population continually rising. I mean, having worked for Bill Birch, the Muldoon government sinking lid, um, efficiency gains mantra, what I'm well aware of in the public sector that the moment you put fiscal pressures on organisations, what normally goes is quality. Uh, and, and I think one has to be a lot more transparent about that. We need to inform, respect and meet the obligations of the Treaty of Waitangi. And I think the first part of that is actually understanding what they are within particular institutions. Monitor proportionality, and I'll talk that in a bit more. We need to know when past extremes of policy endure to the present. After all, the life course of people being what it is, of 70, 80, 90 years, I could tell you more specifically, um, mean, means that what we do to people when they're young can carry on right through for half a century. And of course, ultimately, we want to enable informed curiosity, focused research, challenge and reflection. If we don't tell people anything, then actually they're not going to know what to be nosy about. But my, my next question is, is, what I've did is I took the five reviews of Oranga Tamariki, and I did it not to criticise Oranga Tamariki, enough has been done of that, but firstly, this is a rare occasion when we had an ombudsman, a children's commissioner, a Fanawara-led review and an internal expert, actually five different perspectives, two reports from the Children's Commissioner, on one issue. So you've got everything ranging from a judicial to a professional view. And I think what that, we very rarely see that, and it just reminds us of what is the scale, the breadth of evidence that we need for people to trust an institution. And that the, the three central elements, of course, I put, uh, whoops, well, um, one is that whole sense of accessible, transparent information about what actually what's going on with outcomes and context. Um, and just telling us about what's going on in prisons or in institutions certainly doesn't meet that. Operational assurance. Why do people trust what we're doing? And it's not just you know, nothing to see here. It's got to be about demonstrations, some of which may be done by independent third parties. And I think one of the sad things, certainly I can, if I compare the New Zealand government with the British government, I think New Zealand civil servants shy away from independent third party review. Um, whereas my, and so when we do have that, the best thing is to get a safe pair of hands. Whereas certainly my experience in the British government was, if you're gonna be done over, get done over by the best uh, person around. Uh, because your report is gonna linger for quite a while, so it might as well be of real value. Uh, it's not a mindset in New Zealand. I think so understanding of proportionality, vindication of system capability. And I don't just mean the department. I mean, how do you deal with the organisations that you relate to, including, for example, in justice, social welfare, whānau, uh, families? And then finally, what's the public legitimacy of the work you're doing? Um, and, and what is and the proportionality of the science and practice that shape what you're doing? So where's the independent peer review of your ideas? Where's the international experience? Just a wee cheeky thought. Now, I also, when I did that, I suddenly I realised that proportionality has often been hijacked by researchers, and including even, I, I remember Manitou Māori in the 1980s, of simple ratios of disparity. What's happening to my rate compared to European, for example, disparity or, dispropor or proportionality ratios? Well, I think right at the start, there's a general issue of disproportionality, of invisibility. Do we bother to find out? And sometimes that happens with a, a bit of good, honest civil disobedience, uh, when someone says we ought to know, and that may stimulate often an independent third party review. There can be a loss of, of human rights that we statisticians can't measure. And so there's a, a judicial element in this, which is, uh, is what we're doing actually going to have a long-term effect that someone can judge? There are group and societal effects, like I'm going to point out that in the 1960s, we took 7%, 6 and 7% of Maori males between uh, when they were either as children or between 17 and 25 and put them into the prison service. We did that for, for well over a decade. Now, t t we also took 1% of non-Maori boys. Now, my mother would say 1%, one in 100 is disproportionate. 
You know, if she thought her wee Lenny was going to end up in child welfare, she would not have been a hell of a please. That would have been disproportionate. So even one in a hundred, you can argue, is disproportionate. So therefore, seven in a hundred, one in 14, is, is, is more. So, and those societal effects, if once you get to one in 14, and you remember if you're putting 7% into child welfare, you've taken it on average about 35% to a children's court. If you have a family of six, then just think of the impact on a family and its continuing existence of the joys of the justice system. Um, when I talk about excess prevalence, you know, Florence Nightingale um, used a simple ratio. She said the chance of, being, of, a, of people dying in British Army barracks is twice that of the population at large. But then she said what that actually equates to is lining up 1,100 young men each year on the Salisbury Plain and shooting them. Uh, which is a slightly more graphic way of getting across to British Army generals that they need to clean up the barracks. Um, and then, what, what I, 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 um, I I'm, then in terms of look at, looking at current trends, I should point out that my, why, why is what I'm doing just a little, a little bit different? And I first, what my, my analysis is actually primarily of Māori as a distinct population and not in relationship to the European population. We often, we, Māori have a, 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 one of the most extraordinarily dynamic populations. It, its dynamism is far different from that of the um, European population. You know, in 1966, for example, half the Māori population was under 15. Uh, and so it's, it's, and it's, it's fertility, in fact, funnily enough, in 1966, in between 1951 and 66, the, the, the number of Māori children doubled and the number of Māori children in urban New Zealand increased by four, but this is the only time I've found in any of New Zealand's populations the doubling of a particular block of people over, of, over that sort of time period. So that gives you the sense of scale of the dynamism. Then, of course, the pill came along and did a wee bit more to, to fertility. I'm not analysing individuals through institutions. I'm analysing institutions through the people they affect. And we often confuse our understanding of systems by looking at the institutions. And that I do it both by looking at age groups, but also cohorts. Um, so people born at a particular time where I'm able to follow them through. And as I mentioned before, proportionality, I, I use more the uh, extreme me measure, measures of excess. And my reference period actually goes back um, to, I've got dated right back to 1910. And I think what's important, I mean, in fact, Harold Wilson, uh, uh, Macmillan once made a comment um, uh, that British statistics were so late they were less useful than last year's train, train timetable. And Harold Wilson popped up and he said, ah, but at least you know which trains you missed. Uh, and, and I think that po point is really important in the justice sector because we've forgotten our history, as I'll show you, yet that history is still immensely important to us. Um, just to, just to start, this, this is just looking at um, good old imprisonment rates, I think. Um, uh, and this here, the blue um, um, bar chart is actually Maori um, prisoners. And the light blue is under 25, and the dark blue is all the rest. And what you can see there, that in total, um, I guess if you're, you're wanting to provide a short-term trend, you'd say that's a lot lower than that. But overall, we really rocketed up Maori imprisonment rates around the time of the Sensible Sentencing Act. Ken, you'll know much more than me about these joys of, of Parliament. But, so we've roughly had the same... A, a statistician with a flat line would say there's not a hell of a difference there, given the year-to-year -year volatility. But what you notice is that there's a, quite a substantial decline in young men. And the other side of that is it actually obscures the fact, therefore, there's been quite a decline since to increase since 2002 in older males in prison. This is the European rate, and this has declined um, significantly, and the bulk of that decline is caused again by young men. What we're seeing globally, and particularly as well in New Zealand, is simply around the world we're not putting so many young men, in, young people, into prison. This is the um, rate for, for, for um, Asian New Pacific, um, the Pacific males, and that's shown a bit of a decline. And again, that decline will be associated with the young. We're putting so few Pacific males, young Pacific males in prison, um, that, that, that it's quite an extraordinary shift. Just going, a wee bit of history, the, the joys of um, history. This, this gives you Maori males in prison. The, the, the blue, again, is under 
20, this is um, 20 to 24, and what you can see there is that extraordinary decline, but what you'll also note is the increase in males above that. This is the average age of prisoners. And what you can see is from the 1960s, when we started bringing in the young men that I referred to, we dropped the average age of prisoners down from about 28, actually down to, to 24. And then, of course, they aged. Uh, and, and so we've just had an unrelenting increase in the average age of Maori prisoners um, since then. And, and I'm sure at some stage um, we'll be having the health ministry organising or sizing Zimmer frames. Um, <laughs> This is just, a, a but what's interesting is you notice the peaks, 1943. Actually, this is the period when the disparity ratio between Maori and non-Maori shifted from two around this period to four. And it's been four since, except during this period here, this period here, it went up to seven times. Um, so this, this, is, this is an interesting period here in the war um, when, when we really shifted the, the share of Maori coming into New Zealand prisons. And then, of course, you've got this big build up here uh, and, and the following decline. Um, I one could talk for hours on that. This is the, the um, non Maori prisoners. Their age didn't drop quite as much. And you can see they didn't increase quite as much, but they were still affected by this desire. In the late 1950s, the Mason Garb Review, I think, which I've got an older sister, so we had one at home. Um, I read it when I was probably too young to uh, find out what I was meant to be getting up to. Um, but that basically, along, and Bromwood Daly has written a wonderful book explaining the whole series of things in the late 1950s and 60s in New Zealand um, of, of, of what a panic, a moral panic we had about what went on in Lower Milk Bar and how that was actually going to affect the whole of us in New Zealand. Uh, so if you're, if you're uh, born in my generation, you're lucky you escaped the net. And if you're a Maori in particular, you uh, were even luckier. Um, and if you're a Maori family of six, you're probably quite rare if you escaped this random uh, assignment. And what you'd see here is the European numbers have dropped quite significantly. And in fact, and so of course, of the younger age again, but the actual European numbers of over, over 25 have actually dropped a little bit also, but not perhaps as large as, as um, someone interested in presenting these figures as good might want to say. Now here's just giving you the age specific rates. So in not, even in 2006, we took 5% of Maori males, 20 to 25, and imprisoned them. And that rate has dropped down quite dramatically to about 15, 1.5% um, now. And you can see what's happened with 17 to 19. That's dropped down to just under um, half a percent. The 20 to 5 to 29 rate, however, is resilient to change. And that's surely an interesting bit for people who understand human beings uh, as to what, why has this drop not affected that group. The interesting thing also we ought to remember is this group is probably prime fatherhood age. Uh, so we're putting basically 5% of Maori fathers in prison. Um, at, well, this is 4%, but if I add, three, if I add the number of Maori, male, Maori males in remand for three or more months, this comes to 5.5%. So, so basically, 1 in 18 Maori male uh, between 25 and 29 is always in prison. Uh, which is, a, again, if you think of... Uh, if, if, I, I'm not an expert on the translation between prison and effect on families, um, but we know that prisoners have, uh, according to the work of Subaru, somewhere about 70% of prisoners have children. Um, so th th this here's the um, non-Maori rate, um, and, and th this is the rate for um, 17 to 19, and that's for, and I think if you're looking at disparity ratios, which is a valid thing, you'd almost say disparities have increased, but look at the massive nature of that fall um, in difference. And then, then this, this, of course, is 25 to 29, and you can see for non-Maori, this is all pretty resilient. To European, it's fairly resilient to change as well. When I look at the older group, um, this is 20, uh, 25, uh, to, uh, 30 to, sorry, 30 to 39, well, they're still going up. Um, we look at 40 to um, 49, it's still going up. We look at 50 to 59. Well, you might say that's an accidental blip. Uh, you know, the night watchman might have put a different number in. Um, 
in, you, again here, so in many ways what you can see is a system, a justice system, which has managed to pick up on global trends to stop putting young men in prison at the same rate, but we've really, as a country, not been particularly effective at older males over 25. Um, and just an interesting, just to come back to the European one, but, but to tie it up, just to confirm, you can see massive drop for 70 to 19, massive drop for uh, 20 to 25, and virtually no change for 25 to 29. A little bit of drop in older males. In fact, interestingly enough, when you get to 60 pluses, it's the one area where there are more older ma ma non Maori males in prison than Maori males, and one suspects that's a mix of probably corporate fraud and honest paedophilia. Um, <laughs> so, given the public cases recently. Um, just an interesting, this is a cohort analysis that uh, the Ministry of Justice very nicely prepared, where this is saying in 1978, if you follow through um, every person born in 1978, by the time they were 20, um, this, this is, um, sorry, this is 20 here, 3.5% um, in 1978 um, had had a conviction. And this lot here is saying, by those born in 99, uh, one and a half percent had, uh, had, had a conviction. And so you can see the decline, the, in fact, since, since about 1990, 1991, you can see a real break in the statistics that we've got of following three people through the justice system. And so this is a power of the cohort studies, it's done on the IDI, um, and it's just a reminder we've got quite rich tools um, uh, when we want to use them. And this is looking at the imprisonment rates, um, and so you can see here, um, about tw it's a little longer than that, but about 20% of males born in 1981 ended up having time in prison at some stage. Um, and then we come back to here, and you can see that not much change for here, and then we're starting to see quite, that's a, quite massive reductions. Um, so three, about nearly 3.5% um, ended up in prison of 17, uh, of, by 18, um, in 1981, and we've, we're barely down to less than half a percent. So you can see this quite significant shift um, in what's going on. Now this is a bit of history, and I apologise for the colours. I, I didn't go and buy a sort of a child's colouring kit. Uh, I just used the defaults of uh, PowerPoint for a minute. Um, but what you can see here, this is telling you the share out of a per 100,000, the number that have been in prison between 1911 and 2020. Uh, and what I've done is I've just taken the average over three years around the census date. And what you can see is that in 1911, we put about 6% of Maori males um, under 17 to 19 in prison. When we got to 1971, we put 6%. So we really gave the system quite a shock. And that built up. Um, and we were, of course, putting children into care at the same rate, or taking them in care of custody. And so, and then 1971, this is what we did to 24 to 25. So these are the highest rates of imprisonment of any culture at any time, forgetting the, the early arrival and the, and the, 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 the New Zealand wars that existed and the consequences. These are the highest rates of imprisonment, and I defy anyone to find a higher rate. Uh, you know, the, the, so this is one in 14 were put in prison. Um, and so you come, to, and so what you're seeing here is this, the circles are really, in 1971 you can see even for 25 to 29 year olds we were quite high. Um, and what's interesting about this is if you come to the 40 to 49 year olds, what you find is they're relatively low and then suddenly you get to 1990, 1996, when this lot here that were imprisoned in 1970s reach 40. And interestingly enough, the imprisonment rate of Maori males in 1996 wasn't a hell of a different than the imprisonment rate of Maori males in 1956 or 1926. But we certainly rocketed them up when this group here aged and passed through the system. And again, you can notice it for 30 to 39 years old. I've got 1986 marked there. You can see the ramping up, of the ageing of the generation that we decided for various reasons, possibly because of their birth year, um, needed to have some uh, affinity with the state's custodial institutions. So what you're seeing here, this is showing you the trend. And this is crude, right? This is no, no statistician. Uh, I've got some colleagues here who would be embarrassed if I called it a trend. But no, this is showing you the path 
that we're on, if I can use a glib politically insensitive, insensitive word. And this is again the path we seem to be on here. Um, we can be confident of this, these are international trends. There's also something hugely in the water, is there not in New Zealand about the desire to incarcerate people for the sake of it? Uh, we seem to have lost a, a lot of our biases. We have a police, a judicial system, um, which has lost a lot of the particular reasons why these people came into prison or child custody. Um, but we've got this legacy. So since the 25 to 29 year olds have barely changed, the path they're on hasn't changed much for 50 years. So we're really resilient to any form of policy, um, even the Bail Sentencing Act or the um, Sentencing Act didn't do quite as much or did a bit. And then we come to the 30 to 39 years old and you can see that while we were meandering around there, we've been on a solid path upward since and again for those oh, 40 to 49. Um, um, just to just a look, it's interesting when we look at um, child welfare, this is the, uh, when I took, take the average of males and females, um, 20 to 25 in prison per capita and per capita for 17 to 19 year olds. And I look at the sh average of children in state care, which is about um, one in 64, these lines have now crossed over. So I know that state care has changed over the years of this. I think what we did to um, people in state care in 1971 is very different than now. But this is still the, the relationship of the state with generations. Uh, and so what, I guess the question I would ask as someone who knows nothing about the justice sector is will this trend, upward trend here, influence this trend? It's quite a natural question that a man in the street or one of the hundred people that seem to have commented on the justice sector in the last two days uh, and what law changes would think about. Just flicking through the extremes, I've got a couple of, one is in 1960 a sharp rise began in imprisoning young men. A similar rise occurred in, in state custody and I'll show that. During the peak periods, 1% of non Maori, uh, which I would argue was disproportionate, and 7% of Maori were taken into custody. Um, and for Maori, by 1940, the rate of state custody, as I said, rose. Um, it's really quite significant that the Maori population in 1966, half it was under 15. So if you think about it, we took into prison, about over, if we add girls in as well, we took 4.5% of Maori children. Um, who were half the population into a state custody. Um, and that could have been, uh, uh, we include the Borstal population as well, um, qu quite a significant amount. Um, and, th and this, the other, the demographically, the other thing which is critical about that period, 1966, this was the peak growth, the dynamism, the, the, almost the, 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 the ultimate shift in the resurgence of the Maori population from its, its um, bottoming out in, in 1900. Um, and so just a, a moment, here's what we did to state wards. Um, we went to, from 1946, we went from about 4,000. Then we just got quite excited and we added about 7,200. You'll notice that uh, in fact, the number dropped off before the, child wealth, uh, before the children and young persons legislation. Um, and then it, we, we didn't keep any statistics for this period, by the way. Uh, so we've got some odd studies but somehow or other, when we introduced the children and young persons legislation, our evaluative competence, and perhaps David Preston can tell us why, um, it seemed to go by the board. Uh, so we, we only now have very good statistics since 2000 uh, of what we did. Just as I should have pointed out in the justice sector, I can go to the Victoria University Library as I've done and found what, how we imprison people from 1910 to 1990, and I can look on the Stats New Zealand website uh, and get what we did to people in, from 1999, but I can't find what we did to the prison numbers between 1990 and 1999. Uh, so somehow or other in New Zealand in that decade, we obviously weren't a lot, there wasn't a lot of interest. I've also put alongside this adoptions, because between 19, late 40s and early 80s, 87,000 babies were taken into closed adoptions, generally by the state, offering advice to unmarried mothers who are under 20 or in their early, very young marri unmarried mothers. And that advice was often uh, somewhat forceful, uh, to put it mildly. So you actually, this is where the state's desire to uh, help people by institutionalising them or uh, having particular policies, um, we're not quite sure of the intellectual or th theoretical basis of these, is significant. Um, 
just looking at the, this is how we suddenly ramped up the rate of appearing in court statistics. It suddenly ramped up. This is for uh, Maori males, Maori females, and for non-Maori boys. Um, just as again, just rem the, if I go back over a hundred years, this is the this is um, dis the, the disparity rate. So you can see it whopped up from one. Suddenly we get to 1940s, and it's it's increased again um, to two, and, and then or sorry to four, and then it whopped up to about seven here. Um, and then we're back down again. It's now up to a bit more um, like seven. Um, just an interesting crossover period. Useful. This is a period of huge Maori urbanisation. And what we tend to forget is there's a sort of a myth in some people that urbanisation took Maori into the justice system. Well, actually, urbanisation took young Maori into the justice system, but the old ones stayed in the workforce, uh, and their rates of imprisonment of Maori over 25 virtually didn't change between 1961 and 1981, with a bit, with a bit of volatility, as there always is, with the joys of prison statistics. And this is just looking at, this is a wee study that Stats New Zealand did in 1990, in its last year when it actually was responsible for prison statistics and justice. And, and you can see this is a cumulative rate per birth. Cut. So and for Maori males born 1921, um, four percent ended up actually spending time in prison by the time they were 35. That number whopped up for the number born in 56 to about seven percent. Um, I've lost the top ends because the study was these people hadn't got old enough by the time the study was done. And then this is the, the comparative figures now. Um, and, but of course this is exaggerated slightly because it includes first time in prison from remand. So there's a uh, that's not that's separate. but you can see the what we can learn a lot from the cohort studies that we have the ability to do. Just behind the trends, this is just a wee reminder, this is the share of the Maori population in each of these age groups, and this here, 50%, this is 1966. But you can see the extraordinary dynamism of the Maori population in the share of the population at different ages. From, from 1886, this, and this is really the, the lowest level of the Maori population here, and this uh, population increased uh, fertility actually never changed. It, well, it went down quite a bit through um, STDs that, that seem to have been brought into New Zealand. But from the, 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 the late 80s, fertility, 1880s, fertility didn't change, but infant mortality did. So actually, survivorship was the thing that kept rocketing up these birth numbers. Um, and then, of course, fertility did change um, for the benefits of medical science. Um, and here's just this, now the Maori population shifted here in terms of numbers by definition. We shifted the, this is based on biological definition. This is when we moved to self-identification um, in the 1986 uh, census. And a few colleagues here were involved, uh, shared with me the pleasure of that. Now just, I want to look at proportionality to conclude. This here shows you what the disparity rates tell you. So basically, at each age, um, 0 to 20, 20 to 29, you can see that disparity was around 6 for a lot of this period at the individual age specific rates, and in the last few years, it's climbed up quite a bit. I tend to be a bit reserved about disparity rates when it comes to populations where the denominator is small because it tends to amplify the ratio a, a bit. But what's more interesting is if we use Florence Nightingale's measure of excess, if we take the number of males in prison, this is the European number. This is the number of Maori that would be in prison if we had the same rate for Maori as we have for European. And this is the excess. This is the extra number of by different ages. So you can see we've got an extra number of, of, of just under 100 extra young Maori males, 17 to 19. We've got an extra 500 young Maori males, 20 to 25. And then you can see the excess. And what you'll see is interesting is the excess of the aged, of the, oh, you're not aged over 25, really. Um, although for some people here you might be. Uh, but uh, the excess is, is, is increasing. And so you can see that whatever we've done in the justice system, really from about 2004, five, this is, um, uh, th th this is Phil Goff's, time as Minister of um, Justice. I think he built four prisons, more than almost anyone. Uh, one shouldn't, and, and, but you can see there's really not a lot of change when you look at the variability in the Maori excess from for over that whole period. And where there has been an improvement in the young, we've taken up the slack by um, putting more older males in prison. And this is just showing you a bit more. If I take the age-specific 
imprisonment rates of Māori in 99 and apply them in later years, this tells me the excess. Um, now, so what we've got is this is a, that we've got, we've essentially got 1,500 fewer young Māori males under 25 in prison than we would have had if the earlier, if the 1990 rates had applied, but we've taken up that slack with um, more Māori at these ages, uh, at the older ages. So we basically had a transfer of Māori from young to old. Just looking at remand populations, it's interesting enough, the average time on remand in New Zealand prisons now has gone from uh, four and a bit, year, bit month, weeks to over 11 weeks. Now, if, you, if, if your doctor's waiting, remand, I suppose you could argue, I might be, I'm, in your company, Ken, I'll be careful, but I would argue that the remand situation's a bit like your doctor's waiting room. Uh, you know, you, you, you get it, you're in, in, in a remand situation, you're being put in prison with people who, um, some people would say are not generally nice always. Uh, so being in remand for longer than you need to be has probably got a wee bit of a cost. So here we are, no, this isn't a figure that the ministers of justice or corrections publish, and nor do the courts, but this is, and this is an interesting example where if this is efficiency in the courts, then what it does is efficiency in the courts is passed on to the number of people in the prison system. So actually what we're seeing is a cost to the prison service in not being able to get people through the courts. This is also, obviously, this is the Bail Amendment Act here. This is Parliament deciding to increase the number of people who are on remand without necessarily thinking of the consequences. Um, I'm sure they may do, um, but... but, but they obviously do it in private. Um, and so what, what you can see is, and the interesting thing is, the remand for short set times hasn't changed much, but the, we're now putting more and more people in for quite long periods on remand. Um, and that was my earlier comment, that do we understand fully the effect on the quality of service that you get in the prison service? I mean, we know that double bunking has increased quite considerably, for example, of the people in prison, remembering that we put people into prison for punishment, not as punishment. Uh, so just a, a little thought. And just a, and this is just actually looking at the remand prisoners as a share of the total age group. You can see, as I said, 5.5% of Maori males, um, 25 to 29, are now in prison. And actually, if you add the 30 to 39-year-olds, 1 in 20 Maori males between 25 and 40 are always in prison. One in 20, always in prison. Um, um, and this just, by the way, just looking at the shift, this is my final, final comment. Um, and this is just showing, this is what's happened to remand numbers. This is the European numbers. This is the number of Maori we would have if the same rate were applied to um, European population. And you can see the huge shift there. The impact of remand changes has overwhelmingly been on older uh, Maori males. Um, and the interesting thing is here, I haven't analysed the European block, um, and so I couldn't speculate there, but it may well be the same. And just looking at the share of people now in three or more months on remand compared to sentencing, what you can see is that if you are a male, uh, 17 to 19 year old and Maori, um, then you have got the same chance of being 45% of the Maori male population that's in prison, either sentenced or three or more months on remand, is actually three or more months on remand. So we're building up um, through the remand population policies an increased share of each age group that is in prison on remand. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I just, just, just want a little. Can I just conclude by, by just making a point of what I, th I thought I've actually been, um, be, be, been saying? I took two. Com the key, key conclusions are actually past policies continue to influence prison numbers. Um, the policy extremes in the 60s to 80s involved both state custody of children and young men at, at quite extreme rates. And that for Māori, the demographic structure of Māori over the years has actually resulted in societal impacts on a scale that we never thought about. Um, the change in recent years in sentence numbers has been overwhelmingly dominated by a decline in young men under 25 going into prison. Uh, we've virtually seen very little movement. And further reductions in younger prisoners 
given you look at those low levels, are not going to deliver much more of a reduction. So, if you're, so you can't actually extrapolate what's happened by anything that implies a ruler. Um, older prisoner numbers have declined to a lesser extent for European, but they actually increased for older Māori, and remand prisoners are on a strong upwards track and disproportionately affect Māori. Um, that sense of, between t of Māori, three Māori males between 25 and, and 40, 5%, 1 in 20, are in prison at any time. And finally, the sort of volatility of child welfare notifications and remand does provide an unmeasured pressure on service quality. And as I say, I, I, having been in the New Zealand government for, I started 50 years ago, uh, worked through Mr Muldoon, Bill Birch, um, Roger Douglas, um, and, and um, English, um, and Ruth Richardson. I can tell you the joy of ministers in saying, we are reducing your budget for efficiency gains without having the slightest interest in reduction in quality. Um, it's been a very, very powerful and enduring effect on the New Zealand government, and I would be horrified, I would be absolutely delighted if we now have a much more constructive fiscal approach to budgeting that will ensure that didn't happen. Anyway, thank you very much for talking and thank you for being brave and coming out at lunchtime.